the broadcast of the regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live broadcast of our virtual meeting of the May 18th, 2021 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Madeline Sundberg and I serve as chair of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Bjornberg will not be with us this evening. Uh, Commissioner Booty. Present. Commissioner Howard. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Nystrom. Present. Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Stady. Here. Commissioner Struthers. Here. Commissioner Sundberg. Present. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Here. We have eight members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we do have quorum. With that, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We will go we will work from the agendas that are available online. I will go through the agenda and sort out which items will be continued to a future meeting, what items will be discussed, and what items will be put on the consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff and without further discussion. Item number four is 3400 DuPont Avenue South Ward 10. This is a certificate of appropriateness. Um, that item will be discussed. And item number five is 420 Main Street, uh, Ward 3. This is a certificate of appropriateness. This item is recommended for consent unless someone wishes to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendations. Um, at this time, I would like to ask if there's anybody on the call who wishes to speak in opposition or to modify the staff recommendations for item five, if you could press star six and let me know that you are here um, to do so, so I can pull it from the consent agenda. I'll give you a moment. Okay. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. Are we talking about DuPont right now? Uh, no, we're talking about the 420 Main Street. Okay. I'm sorry. You can mute me. That's okay. Um, it doesn't seem like there's anybody here to object to 420 Main Street. Uh, the proposed agenda is the consent agenda will include item number five, 420 Main Street. Um, we will approve the consent agenda items in one motion at the start of the meeting. And then item number four, uh, 3400 DuPont Avenue South will have a staff presentation, public comment, commission discussion, and action. Um, commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the proposed agenda? Johnson moves. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Booty seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Any discussion? With that, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. Eight days and zero nays. Thank you. The agenda is approved. Our next order of business will be to approve the minutes from our May 4th, 2021 meeting. 
May I have a motion to approve those minutes? Johnson moves. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Nystrom second. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Any discussion? With that, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Stavey. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Vanderike. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. Thank you, the minutes are approved. Um, before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting the public hearing in this virtual format. Um, first, we'll act on the consent agenda that we just set. Once items on the consent agenda are approved, the commission is done with those items and applicants may contact the planning staff tomorrow for next steps. After the consent agenda items are approved, we'll take each remaining agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of staff. Then we will hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I will open the public hearing and we will invite public comment. We will take speakers in the order they pre-registered. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. We ask that after your name is called, you state your name and address for the record and then proceed to your comments. After we've completed the list of any pre-registered speakers, we'll see if there are any other speakers in the queue who may have called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and then wait to hear the pre-recorded message before you start speaking. Um, so again, I'll take the list of pre-registered speakers in order and then open the floor to any other speakers in the queue. Um, please keep your comments to the specific application that is before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and act on the applications before us. So I will now open the public hearing on the consent agenda items. So again, this is 420 Main Street. Um, so this is a, a last call. Is there any opposition to staff recommendations for these items? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on the consent agenda items. May I have a motion to approve staff findings and recommendations for these items? Johnson moves. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Vander Eyck seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Vander Eyck. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Vanderike. Aye, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. And Commissioner Sundberg. Abstain. Oh, yes. Uh, so that's seven yeas and one abstention. Thank you. Um, those items are approved as recommended by staff on the agenda. Applicants for those items may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. Our next agenda item is number four, 3400 DuPont Avenue South, Ward 10, Certificate of Appropriateness. The staff report will be presented by John Smalley. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smalley and I'm pleased to be before you this evening to present a Certificate of Appropriateness application for 3400 DuPont Avenue South. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
3400 DuPont Avenue South is a locally designated landmark, the Adath Jeshurun Synagogue, the first Orthodox synagogue in Minneapolis. It was constructed in 1926 and 1927 in the neoclassical style and designed by architects Liebenberg and Kaplan. A modern education wing, which you can see in the, about the center of this photo, was added in 1954. The property was acquired by its current owner, the First Universalist Church, in 1993, and the exterior of the property is designated. Next slide, please. Here's the property as it appears in 1948, about the middle of the period of significance. Next slide, please. And here's the property as it appears uh, very recently. You can see the synagogue in the foreground. And off to the left side of the photo, you can see the two-story education wing. Next slide, please. The applicant's scope of work is fairly extensive. They want to replace the historic education wing aluminum storefront to include the doors with a thermally broken double glaze system to address egress, security, and energy conservation concerns. They'd also like to replace the 1977 aluminum windows in the northeast stairwell with a thermally broken double glaze system, as well as install solar panels on the roof of the education wing, install a small retaining wall along the east walk, uh, where a new sloped walk was installed last year, install a handrail and bumper rail, install a six foot tall fence on the backside of the building to create a safe play space, add parking lot lighting, upgrade some building lighting, add path lighting along the east sloped walk to the atrium, replace the roof of the synagogue, and install an illuminated monument sign at the east entry of the property. This is a fairly substantial scope of work. In addition to the recently approved ramp, roof, and masonry repair work that the applicant had approved administratively. Like that work, staff recommends approval of this new scope of work, with two exceptions. Those are noted on the slide before you in red. Next slide, please. Staff recommends the serviceable historic storefront style systems be preserved for reasons of sustainability and compatibility. In terms of sustainability, the applicant's goal is to reduce energy costs in the building itself but approximately 27 years of energy savings will be required to recoup the cost of replacing these serviceable historic features. And substantial energy savings will be accrued by installing a solar array on the roof of the education wing, which staff does recommend approval of. In terms of compatibility, the replacement aluminum framing generally, though not exclusively, but generally doubles the aluminum framing component widths visibly altering the appearance of these historic features. The increased component width in the proposed doors does serve a purpose beyond energy efficiency, however. The increased component width will facilitate replacement of the historic doors interior bars and flip lock with building code compliant surface mount panic exit bars, which require thicker frame components for mounting. For this reason, staff recommends the proposed replacement of those doors be allowed. Next slide, please. I've posted images of the three storefront style systems that staff recommends be preserved with the exception of the uh, French doors on the connection between the education wing and the synagogue itself. You can see that in the upper left-hand corner of the photo uh, labeled SF1. Staff recommends all three of those storefront style systems, those historic anodized aluminum storefront style systems be preserved with the exception of the two French doors, again, for egress purposes. I'm available for any questions you may have, and I know the applicant is here and would like to make a presentation as well. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? I don't see any questions at this time. Thank you, John. Um, it sounds like the applicant is here. Uh, Jennifer Crow, 
if you would like to speak, if you could press star six so that we can hear you. Hi, this is Jennifer Crow. I'm here. I can hear you. Thanks. Great. You ready for me to start? Yep, if you can give your name and address and then proceed to your comments. Sure. My name is Jennifer Crow. My address is 3708 Pleasant Avenue in Minneapolis. And I serve as the senior co-minister at the First Universalist Church of Minneapolis. We're asking you to reconsider the recommendation against replacement of the atrium storefront. I heard it stated that our, one of our primary goals was to reduce energy costs, and that is not in fact the case. Of course, we would like to reduce any energy costs, but really we're trying to create a building that is in alignment with our values. So like any religious institution, we hold a set of values that guide our faith and our practice. As Unitarian Universalists, we ground ourselves in seven principles, and two of them are particularly relevant today. One of them is we affirm and pr promote the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. The second, we live with respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. So the changes that we've requested to our atrium storefront directly support increased accessibility and inclusion of people with limited mobility and also reduce our environmental impact, thereby supporting our religious principles. I think it's also important to note that as universalists, we believe that every person is born whole and holy and worthy, and that it's our job to create communities that welcome all people. And that is what we're trying to do in our congregation. So in 2016, our congregation embarked on a capital campaign to renovate and improve our building, to make it more welcoming and inclusive and accessible to everyone. The capital campaign was titled, Not For Ourselves Alone, Building an Inclusive Future, and it inspired us to live even more deeply into our values to create this new central entrance, which is that atrium entrance, to essentially create a new front door that would be a place that everyone could enter into together, accessible to everyone. The doors of the atrium and the glass there and the storefront are the centerpiece of our new front door. It's a physical representation of the wide welcome that we proclaim in our faith and the inclusion that we strive to embody. So our congregation absolutely honors the history of our building and the people who dared to proclaim a place in Minneapolis, people of worth and dignity in a largely anti-Semitic city and a neighborhood that would have preferred they not be there. We honor their legacy, we live into it, and we ask that you approve our requests to create a front door that will truly welcome everybody. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain um, in a little bit more detail um, how the, because as, as I understand it in the drawings, you're wanting to switch the kind of like flip-flop where the doors and windows are on that atrium. Correct. And yep. um, how, can you explain to us how that improves the accessibility? Sure. So the primary thing is we'll be moving the doors over to the side of the entrance where the ramp is. So folks would be able to come directly up the ramp and in the doors. And then it would allow us to create a resting space, like a little nook on the other side of that entrance where folks who need a break from movement can stop and rest and kind of regroup. So it's really about creating the, the link immediately from the ramp up into the building to make it as easy as possible and then to be able to create a little resting area in there as well. And I know our architects are with us, so they might uh, be able to speak to this even more as well. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant? I don't see any at this time. Um, if your architect is here and would like to speak to that, I think that would be helpful. Great. This is Erin Grammis. Hi, I can hear you. Great. Uh, my name is Erin Grammis. I'm at 4916 West 86th Street in Bloomington, uh, 55437. Um, what Jen said is correct. Uh, we swapped the door, the storefront, mirrored it for just that reason to create uh, direct accessibility off the ramp. And then on the interior side to create that waiting space, um, logistically on the interior side, there are some, some existing conditions that wouldn't allow us to put a seating area 
in the opposite corner because of doors and storage closets and things like that. So it made more sense to to move it to the other side where there's optimal space for for several people to, you know, sit and wait for a bus or for someone to pick them up or to just sit and wait and rest. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the architect? Oh, this is Commissioner Johnson. Just to be clear, there is currently an accessible entrance, correct? There, yes, there is. This is one of the accessible entrances, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see any at this time. Thank you for your comments. Can I have a follow up question real quick? Oh, okay. I also have a, a prepared statement, but oh, yes. should I wait my turn or should I, no, should I do that? You can give now? your prepared statement. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for your time. My name is Erin Gramis. Like I said, I work for LHB and I'm one of the architects working on this project. So I'm also going to focus on the storefronts in question and um, would like to make two points. First, um, we actually were really disappointed to see that our argument to replace the storefronts was reduced to saving money, as stated under number four of the analysis section. Like Jen said, this isn't the case and it's only a fraction of the story. The church has always understood that making energy improvements to their building would be a financial investment, which they are willing to make. We did not provide the HPC with a 27 year payoff calculation as they provided in their analysis, nor do we think it's accurate. The main reason for replacing the storefronts is like Jen said, rooted in the Unitarian Universalist core religious tenet of environmental responsibility. Replacing the single pane glass with a better system is only part of this effort as shown by the church's investment in new roofing and solar panels. Additionally, the energy savings are not perceived as the staff summary states. We have demonstrated in our energy analysis that the amount of energy saved by replacing these few windows is the equivalent of around 6,000 miles driven by the average car, 300 gallons of gas, or 300,000 smartphones being charged. The second point and last point I would like to make is that the analysis states that the proposed window profiles will double in width in several cases. We worked very diligently to come up with details that match the historic details as closely as possible. And while the storefront mullion depths will increase, we were able to keep the widths of the mullions very similar when viewed from the exterior. Yes, some of the mullions on the larger window windows will need to increase from one inch to two inches, but we feel that the overall aesthetic effect of this will be minimal. The National Park Service, the folks who write these guidelines, recently replaced all the original aluminum frame windows at its historic visitor center in Death Valley with carefully detailed modern replacements for many of the same reasons that we are undertaking to do this work. We feel that our proposed changes follow that precedent, which had buy-in from the National Park Service and the California SHPO. I've submitted some reading material regarding this project. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, commissioners, I want to check one more time to see if there are any questions for the design team. Before I move on to the rest of the public comments. Doesn't sound like it. Um, so with that, um, I will open the public hearing on this item and I will go through this list of pre-registered speakers in order and then open the floor to any other speakers who may be in the queue. Um, again, if you can provide your name and address before making your comments. And um, when I call your name, you could press star six on your phone, wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate your microphone so we can hear you and then uh, proceed to your comments. Um, the so the next person I have in the queue is um, Michael Lovato. You can press star six. Hello, I can hear you. Hi, this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Oh, hi. Yes, my name is Michael Lovato. I am uh, at 3518 Beard Avenue in Robbinsdale, 55422. 
and uh, so, like I said, uh, my name is Michael Votto. I'm a historical architect with LHB, and I assisted on the design of this project. I wanted to address the condition regarding the retention of the aluminum frame components at the 1950s edition. I'm also a board member with Docomomo US Minnesota, which is an organization that advocates for uh, mid-century modern architecture. So I do absolutely appreciate modern architecture. Uh, with com components like this, I, I think that the character defining features are really more related to the effects that they create than the actual materials themselves. Uh, the original design intent was creating large open expanses of glass that help break down the barrier between interior space and exterior space. They were designed to be simple, elegant, and minimal as possible using off-the-shelf components. Unlike historic wood windows, which were made by hand and designed to be repaired in perpetuity, these uh, aluminum storefronts weren't really designed to be repaired or modified. And even if it doesn't happen with this project, they'll continue to wear out. And at some point, I believe they will need to be replaced. Uh, fortunately, uh, off-the-shelf components or off-the-shelf aluminum components are still readily available. And I believe that the overall integrity of the design intent of this modern portion of the building will not be significantly damaged by replacing those two features with clean, modern uh, aluminum storefront systems that match the original features as closely as possible. Additionally, as historic preservationists, we are always toting the inherent passive sustainable features of old buildings that were built before modern HVAC systems. And we often do that by comparing these to the energy hogs of the mid late 20th century uh, that put in wall-to-wall -wall glass and relied solely on tons of energy to provide thermal comfort. I too am skeptical of many of the arguments about replacing original historical features in the name of sustainability, but I believe that the standards that we use every day to make these decisions were developed uh, for buildings of a different era. So I do think it's worth considering adjusting our approach to different features from different eras uh, to best respect our historic buildings as well as be as well as uh, being energy con as as energy conscious as possible. So that's that's what I would say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, the next name I have in the queue is Laura Cooper. You can press star six. Hello, my name is Laura Cooper, 5001 Queen Avenue South, Minneapolis. I was for 42 years a law professor at the University of Minnesota, and I've also five times taught U.S. First Amendment religious freedom to law students from around the world in courses in Sweden. Now in retirement, I'm a volunteer teacher preparing refugees and immigrants to take the U.S. citizenship test. In class, students of many different faiths some themselves victims in their home countries of religious discrimination, learn the meaning of the First Amendment, religious freedom protection. I hope that when this proceeding concludes, I'll be able to cite this commission's decisions here as an example of how the U.S. protects religious freedom. I was congregational president from 1997 to 1999, uh, when the church's historic designation was first considered by this commission. The church agreed to a consensual resolution without litigation, only when assured that our free exercise rights would not be infringed by the designation scope. That designation explicitly reserved the right of the church to cover, if it wished, one of the most significant features of the building, the inscription, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. As a congregation, we understood that although the building was afforded historic designation because of its role as a synagogue, we nevertheless retained the right to cover this core statement of Jewish faith because we were a religious community whose own religious faith deserved First Amendment protection, and the commission recognized that. We have not chosen to cover that inscription because we, like the HVC, respect the history of the building and of the historic role of the congregation that preceded us. I also know our own church's history, founded in 1859 by church leaders, such as Minneapolis's first mayor and the other white men who created the railway system and designed our city's parks. 
we now strive to welcome the full diversity of Minneapolis residents through our doors. Our proposed entry doors are designed both to symbolize and make real our faith-based commitment to respect the inherent worth and human dignity of all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next name I have on the list is Eric Cooperstein. Press star six. This is Eric Cooperstein, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you. So um, I live at 4212 West 44th Street in Edina, 55424. Um, I uh, also own a law firm in downtown Minneapolis. I am a member of First Universalist Church for uh, 27 years. I am, was also uh, a member of our board of trustees for six years, ending in 2020. And I was board president for three of those years, particularly when we were um, engaging in our capital campaign to renovate this building um, and refreshing our visionary goals, which are the guiding principles of our particular church. I've uploaded those visionary goals um, to your website as part of my submission form. I want to draw the commission's attention, particularly to the um, agreement between the city and the church that Professor Cooper just referenced in 1998, in which um, we agreed to accept historic preservation status in exchange for an agreement that we would be allowed to replace some very significant architectural features of the building in order to accommodate our religious beliefs and freedom. Those features were the front doors um, of the church, the four front doors that are at the top of the steps as you look through the, the door from DuPont Avenue, and the stained glass windows that were in the sanctuary. These are very significant features, but they were not consistent. Um, with what we wanted to create in this church and the city agreed that they needed to respect our religious freedom. In the same context, um, I think that the commission should respect um, the, the sentiments um, and be consistent with that agreement to allow us to make this change. One of the um, commissioners I think asked whether there were other accessible entrances. There is at least one other accessible entrance off to the side on 34th Ave Avenue. But this entrance is designed to be the main entrance of our building. This is where most of the congregation and visitors will enter our building. We've made several changes that have already been approved by the commission to make this a welcoming entrance. The other entrance that most people use is in the parking lot, which is not accessible. So it is really key to our mission of really living into our values um, of being a welcoming congregation that people of all um, backgrounds and particularly abilities are able to access our ability as freely and as easily as any other member of our congregation. That is, has been of paramount importance throughout this capital campaign, which has been um, in process now for over five years. It is something that we have promised to our congregation, um, and our congregation has, has responded as we know they would as um, wanting our building to be accessible as, as possible. We've made significant improvements and um, devoted resources that might have gone somewhere else to increasing accessibility inside our building as well. And in fact, abandoned several rooms in our building that could not be made accessible because of the priority we place on accessibility. So I, I ask that the commission um, consider this request and change in the context of our values and goals of making our building completely accessible. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next name I have on the list is um, Marnie, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong, P Pichel, if you could press star six. Oh, it looks like Marnie's number is not showing up as online. Um, I will move to the next name then, uh, Dan Berg. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Dan Berg. I live at 4901 Fremont Avenue South, Minneapolis. 
I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak to the commission's recommendation regarding this entrance to First Universalist Church. I've been a member of the church for some 25 years. I've served on the board for six years and I co-chaired the capital campaign that has funded most of the improvements currently underway at 3400 DuPont. I'm retired and a longtime resident of Minneapolis. My primary contribution to this discussion has to do with the architectural intentions regarding the revised storefront entrance on DuPont and what I perceive as its fidelity to the historic design. While reversing the position of the doors for very practical reasons, it appears to me, and I acknowledge that I'm a layman, and also, but also concerned citizen who appreciates the value of historic preservation, that the use of materials and design elements is reasonably faithful to the current aesthetic. As an illustration, I provided in my application request to, to speak a photograph of the current entrance with a line drawing of the proposed revision. To a great extent, it appears that the new door and storefront will be a mirror image of the current design. For this and all the reasons that others have provided having to do with our role as an historic religious entity, an active urban congregation and a good citizen of the uptown neighborhood, I encourage you to reconsider your rejection of this proposed alteration. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, at this time, I've gone through the list of pre-registered speakers. Um, so I would like to check to see if there is anyone else who may be in the queue. Um, if you could press star six and let me know if you are there. Last call. Anyone else calling in to comment? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and open the commissioner discussion. Um, commissioner Johnson, I believe you have a question for staff. Hi, I, I'm wondering if somebody from staff can kind of speak to this letter from the city attorney um, from July of 1998. And what the intent of that front door um, clause is, because that seems to be where um, the discussion is kind of revolving around about this gentleman's agreement. I mean, it's less of a gentleman's agreement and more of a actual agreement from the city attorney at the time. So I'm kind of curious uh, if anybody on staff has the institutional knowledge or you know can give us some background as to that um, that that letter. Uh, Chair Sundberg, Commissioner Johnson, you know, I believe that relates to the synagogue doors themselves. I seem to remember that being listed in the um, uh, city council documentation, but I can certainly check into that and get back to you here momentarily. Thank you, John. Um, does anyone else have a comment they'd like to make? Should I start off the discussion here? Um, I, I'm curious to hear what commissioners think about um, the discussion specifically about the doors, um, because looking at the proposal from a design uh, point of view, I understand um, for like a, a purpose of flow in the space, uh, why they are proposing to flip flop for the, the door with the window. Um, and so I guess I am personally feeling a little, uh, I'm not sure about this one because I, I can see for circulation purposes um, how it would be beneficial to make this change. Um, and I don't feel like it would be a, a huge visual change to the, the building as a whole if the door flipped with the windows. Um, on the other hand, I know we like to preserve existing materials. 
Um, so I'm, I'm hoping some other commissioners have some thoughts, especially on that matter, since it seems to be the real point of contention here. Commissioner Howard. Yeah, I, I can understand uh, your kind of thinking both directions on this one. Um, I, it seems to me that as conditioned, accessibility is still achievable in this space. So if I understood Dr. Smalley's presentation correctly, the doors can still be changed out. So it will be an accessible entrance. Um, uh, the flow of the building, I. I'm afraid that if I were to apply that to most historic properties, <laughs> that argument, I think we would run into lots of issues with whether or not things meet the standards. To me, it's um, uh, it, can these be uh, still reused? Are they, you know, has it deteriorated to the point where uh, they must be replaced? And is it in kind enough? Is the replacement in kind enough? And that's where I, I, I think back to the comment we received, um, I think it was Michael Lovato, the architect and the Docomomo member. I mean, we definitely do have to think differently about integrity and materials when it comes to modern buildings. So um, I, I too have kind of gone back and forth on this one. Um, so I'm, I'm also interested to hear what other commissioners have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. I think that is a good point about integrity uh, with modern materials, because I guess maybe that's the other part of my concern is that um, we, would this be just like kicking the can down the road? Are they going to be coming back in another five years now with new doors, but needing to replace the rest of the storefront system? Um, really have the, the same lifespan. Um, that the older historic materials have. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, materials are do have a completely different lifespan. Um, I suspect that uh, knowing LHB, they probably did try to find the best, um, you know, in kind uh, materials. I am not an expert by any means when it comes to storefront framing. Um, I, I would just point out that some of the discussion that we've heard, or some of the points we've heard thus far, have all been related to the storefront, the actual doors and not the other storefront window systems that are also subject to this condition, um, which don't have anything to do with accessibility to the building in the same way that we think of uh, mobility into the building. So we, we're, we're talking about not just that one storefront, but those other two storefront systems. Yes, I, I've also been thinking about it kind of divided like that. And I guess the the thought I have bouncing around in my head is whether or not um, we allow the, the more significant alteration to that the specific location um, at that but then preserve the the storefront system in the two other locations as sort of a you know keep some for preservation but allow the the one that impacts the the building use more significantly. Um, as a possibility that has kind of been floating around in my head, but um, I'm hoping other commissioners would like to speak to this. Silence. Um, Commissioner Stady. Well, first of all, I, I want to uh, recognize that uh, these these folks are, you know, working to live their faith in their building with environmental stewardship and the respect for human dignity that that happens with these alterations to the building. Uh, the question I have is: is are we talking about the preservation of 1977 windows and anyways, or that's that's where I read that some of this is 1977 material, which I guess I don't have a strong feeling about preserving in the first place. I'm now trying to flip through and see exactly what year um, these windows we're talking about are from. Um, Where I thought I saw 
I'm sorry, this is Commissioner Johnson, just rambling. Perhaps Dr. Smalley could respond. Dr. Smalley, could you tell us what, what year the windows we're talking about are from? Certainly, Commissioner Stady, uh, Chair Subbird. Yes, um, some do date to 1977. The applicant um, notes that in their scope of work. I would point out too that the period of significance goes all the way through 1997. So, you know, this is an unusual designation um, to have, uh, you know, those features, which are technically almost 50 years old, but it is unusual to have um, a designation with a period of significance that's so close to the date of designation, 1998. I would also uh, note too, in answer to Commissioner. Johnson's question. The designation study only refers to the synagogue doors. The designation study and the design guidelines were adopted concurrently by the Minneapolis City Council. So the design guideline provision strictly relates to the synagogue doors, not to the other doors on the building. Thank you for clarifying that, John. Uh, John, as a follow-up question, um, it is unusual to see the period of significance that long. Um, do we have any uh, discussion from the commission at that time when they designated the property on why they kept the period of significance that long? Uh, you know, we talked about that at the staff level and we did wish we were flies on the wall at that time. We don't know that. Um, we do know that, you know, based on the period of significance, these features are historic. Certainly they don't date back to the, um, you know, synagogue itself, but they do certainly date back to you know, uh, the Adath Jeshurun synagogue, you know, congregations tenure on site. And I should point out as well um, to the applicants, the applicants are absolutely right. They did not come forward with strictly a cost factor being their primary reason for wanting um, to replace these features. I mean, obviously they're doing a lot of other work on the building as well, work that staff is recommending approval of, work that you know will serve the long-term interests of the building, the landmark itself, as well as the congregation. Well, it's just challenging to objectively um, analyze applications like this without getting into things like cost, you know, I contemplated getting into R values and U factors as well, um, the specifications. And I did, I requested cost estimates from the applicant. This is not something they put forward um, immediately. That was something specifically that staff requested for this purpose of trying to analyze these, um, you know, analyze this as objectively as possible. Um, the, for what it's worth, the specifications that they provided, which also I did request, indicated that the storefront system would boast a U value or U factor of 0.35, which equates to roughly, you know, just under a three, an R value of just under three. I think it's a 2.85. Um, so the improvement, you know, looking at it from another objective, you know, energy efficiency standpoint, the improvement will help combat climate change to you know a a an extent certainly not as much as you know say um the r value that comes from say insulating your roof uh as fully as possible in those instances instead of like an r3 r value of three we're talking more like an r value of 30 and upwards so replacement of windows just in general as you all know it's a tough sell when it comes to historic properties, replacement of serviceable historic windows. But the applicant has certainly uh, made their case here tonight, and I did want to uh, point out that I had requested those statistics. That was not something they immediately put forward as the linchpin of their argument. Thank you, John. Uh, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Um, all right, so I, I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of strong feelings about this. Um, and so usually when I don't have a lot of strong feelings, I defer to staff. Um, and that's generally what I'm feeling right now. I do I do get where the applicant is coming from. Um, but, you know, uh, I've gone back to this before on our previous meetings. We have to make sure that our rulings are defensible. And it sounds like Maybe it might make sense to to and I, this is a question maybe for um, 
uh, the staff, but to reevaluate this period of significance um, that might um, make more sense to um, kind of cut it off a little earlier uh, for these exact reasons. Um, if the period of significance is what's driving the uh, the windows and the and the what feels like feels like we should be able to work with the applicant here. So that's kind of where I'm like, I don't know, one way or the other, this doesn't um, doesn't sway me the, uh, that either direction. I think what I would like out of my fellow commissioners is to talk me through if we were to um, to go against staff findings in this scenario specific to these windows in this configuration, um, storefront configuration, um, you know, what what are we saying? Like, what what does that mean for our findings? And and maybe give me something more to latch on to um, that is in line with the design guidelines. Um, and then maybe I can have a stronger feeling or opinion one way or the other. But um, that's kind of where I'm standing. I don't, I don't know how um, how we make a finding other than that, but I that's why our, our discussions are always so good and so interesting because you guys help me along in that path. Um, but if we don't find that, then I think we have to go with staff re recommendations um, would be my thoughts on that. So look forward to hearing some other commissioner's thoughts. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Commissioner Stady. Well, I think if we consider the comments we've heard from the applicant and the folks that spoke, I think we should be anticipating a First Amendment argument for um, the reason they want these changes, they, the respect for human dignity or allowing folks uh, with different abilities better access to their, their place of worship. And then, you know, the respect for uh, the environmental stewardship that comes with a more energy efficient building. Uh, my own faith community, uh, those are strong um, parts of our beliefs and we don't have a historic build building. So when we renovated our lobby, added more space, accessibility, front doors. Um, that was a big part of our renovation and we did not uh, work with the HPC, but I, I would, I think that respecting First Amendment worship rights are probably more important than defending um, keeping windows. I, I feel like that might be out of our purview, but I'm guessing that's what Andrea would like to speak on. <laughs> yes, I am going to speak on that. Um, I just want to make a note that the applicants did willingly engage in this application of a certificate of appropriateness. That's what we're going to say on that. Um, and that at the same time, you know, as a city, we are not going to speculate on any claims about religious freedom at this point in time. And we are responding to the application in front of us according to the ordinance. I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks. Andrea, it looks like uh, Claire is wondering has a, has a question in the chat on whether or not um, the period of significance uh, was discussed as a staff level and whether or not it could be altered, which I don't think we can do during one of these types of reviews. We did talk about it quite a bit. Um, I was surprised by it. Um, but no, it's not something that we can do during a meeting. We'd have to look further into a study. We'd have to look into it. We'd have to analyze and come up with a more appropriate period of significance based on evidence and research. But it is not something we can address at this point in time at this meeting. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Howard has a question. Just a quick question. Um, it's my understanding that this is listed, this is des designated, sorry, under um, historical associations, or is it for the architecture or a combination of the two? And I'm trying to quickly scan through uh, the report quickly, but perhaps Dr. Smollett could remind us the criteria that were used for its designation. Certainly, uh, Chair Sundberg, Commissioner Howard, this property, was designated under some older heritage preservation criterion, but essentially it's events and people, not architecture, uh, that are the significant aspects of this property. Thank you, and that's and that's why I'm having trouble with it because it's the old criteria, not the criteria we use today. I think um, that that point, Commissioner Howard, about what criteria is kind of important in my mind um, because. Um, it being for events 
and people, I guess, sp speaking to Commissioner Van Der Eyck, that would be part of my logic for why we might allow um, uh, specifically the, the doors and the storefront of that atrium to, to be altered. Um, because it, since it was for events and people and not the architecture, I don't feel like the original intent of the nomination was to uh, lock in those uh, 1950s doors. Um, I, I, it is really hard when the, the period of significance is so long. Um, Commissioner Booty. Um, I just wanted to chime in with a few of my comments. Um, sorry to kind of interrupt. I know uh, Commissioner Van Der Eyck also wants to speak here um, and might be able to go first um, if <laughs> uh, you were just responding to her, um, but I, I'm happy to wait for my comments too. But they're more general um, and kind of where I'm leaning, so. Okay, I'll jump over. Commissioner Van Der Eyck, did you want to respond to what I was yeah, saying? Yeah, I, um, well, I, uh, you know, if we were on the dais, you would have seen me nodding and agreeing with exactly what you were just saying, Chair Sundberg. I think, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I, um, and I would, you know, I, I so thank you to um, staff member Andrea Burke for, for clarifying that piece on the um, period of significance question. I think um, that's another item, you know, we've got our um, retreat coming up here. These are the types of things I'd like to, I'd like to get some better understanding on um, in a when we're not talking about agenda items. You know, like how do we request these things? These things come up. You know, we we may probably would have never even known that there was a property out there with this long of a period of significance, but for the fact that they they applied for this certificate of appropriateness. So when these things come up, what I'd like us to do as a commission is. Uh, acknowledge that we have to make a decision based on the application that's in front of us, but also acknowledge that we can collectively use our authority to make changes and tweaks that will help these conversations in the future and not just be like, all right, that decision's made, set that aside, um, let's go on to the next application. So, um, you know, just put that as a bookmark for, for our discussion on Thursday about how do we make sure that we have to come to a decision on the applications that are before us, but if they rise um, up other issues or thoughts that we should talk about that those don't we don't lose those in, in the um, in the discussion because um, like for instance I don't think that having a, a period of significance that this is that's this long is appropriate and so I think it would make sense for us to take another look at that um, but yeah I 100% agree that um, referencing what what was originally used um, in in what made this uh, particular building eligible for designation um, isn't architecture specific, isn't to the orientation of this door and entry layout, really feels to me like a strong reason as to why it would be okay to move forward with it, referencing back to what we believe the original intent of the des designation is. So I would agree with that. Be interested to hear what the other commissioners have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Uh, Commissioner Booty, we can jump back to you. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner or Chair Sundberg. Um, I had some more general comments of some of my thoughts of the application. Um, my initial reaction to the replacement of the, the storefront um, uh, systems was not necessarily the same as the city's. Um, I think I generally agree more with um, the architect's analysis of it with the idea that Historic preservation with windows, um, the intent around the, you know, more serviceable type windows from the early, earlier 20th century, late 19th century buildings makes sense for why we wouldn't want to rip those out and replace them. But um, speaking about these windows that were mass produced and the significance of their effect um, seems to be preserved with this application. And given that it's a church that has to you know, raise money to do their own work to the church, wrapping in energy efficiency and uh, their environmental stewardship values into um, this overall larger project makes sense to me. And um, I think that's 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 kind of where my thoughts are just overall of the, um, the, the replacement discussion. Um, the door design does not um, also does not, I don't have any issues with that. I, especially as we're giving um, or talking more about what the the building was actually listed and designated for um, its its association with people rather than architecture. I would be um, in support of what we were just what Commissioner Van Der Eyck, um, had just been discussing um, with uh, opposing the staff findings with um, that as our reasoning. 
Thank you, Commissioner Booty. It, it does sound like we're getting uh, some strong feelings about maybe um, maybe striking uh, condition one completely is kind of what I'm hearing. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I won't echo. I mean, I'm just I agree with what everybody's been saying. It seems like we're trending in a direction now that um, I'm hitching my trailer to. I, you know, knowing that the designation is based on architecture and these windows are from almost the 1980s. Um, I guess I guess I'm looking for a, a something in our toolbox to allow us to go against staff recommendations. I know that we usually need to cite something very specific. Um, and that's definitely not as much my area of expertise. So I guess I'm I'm looking for maybe somebody else on the commission to kind of um, lead that um, or or find that tool, something we can hang our hat on to um, to to rule that way or to make a motion. Um, I just I just don't know what that is. So I think Andrea Burke has some insights on this. In this particular case, responding to your question, Commissioner Johnson, since staff has recommended approval and has just put conditions on it, findings aren't required to overturn, unless you want to overturn it and deny it, but I don't think that's what uh, commissioners are leaning towards. It sounds like you're more leaning towards striking a condition, and I think this has been a great discussion, thinking, uh, going over your thought process about it, which is very helpful to staff. Um, but you can make a motion to strike the condition without a finding. Now, if you want to give a strong reason why, that's okay. I'm, I'm more than welcome and happy to hear that, but um, it is not required in this instance since staff is recommending approval. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, that's what I was going to say, is to, to change conditions, we don't need findings. So, um, Commissioner Stady. I, I was just reminded of... Um, so one of the churches we've recently designated was the St. James uh, Church. And the, we I do remember now we set the period of significance to be really kind of the life of this, the congregation. So it starts in. Um, 1863, even though the building was not um, built until 1959. So I, I wonder if that was the intent with that other uh, historic uh, period of significance. But I also wondered, does SHPO approve the period of significance? That was my other question. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Stady. I was also thinking about St. James as we were having this discussion on period of significance, because I remember we had quite a discussion at the time of that nomination about it. Um, but in that case, I believe the congregation had requested that period of significance. And so it's a slightly different thing. Uh, Commissioner Howard. I think all of this really goes to show how important that period of significance is in designations. And, <laughs> and Andrea, I disagree. I think you probably can respond just fine. But I, 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 we had these conversations before. I think the periods of significance are critical. And we find, you know, in my experience putting on past hats at SHPO, uh, that period of significance is very important for every single federal preservation program area, whether it's tax credits or Section 106 or National Register. And, and we really need to be careful about how those are defined and then how that gets implemented within our design guidelines. Um, uh, you find, I have found with, with churches um, and other uh, social, uh, social associated historic properties, there tends to be a very long period of significance because it, it has to do with the events and trends and the people that are there more so than the architecture. Um, and so I obviously wasn't on the commission when this was designated and I haven't read the full designation report, um, but I suspect it was trying to recognize that long um, Jewish association with this this property and, um, and, and give that history the props it deserved at the time it was being designated and making sure that that Jewish connection um, would still show through uh, down the line. Um, in this case, I think it was um, probably uh, a bit too long to be considered significant. But again, I haven't read the, the full designation study, so I can't speak to that. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, it sounds like you want to make a motion. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness to replace the storefront 
style openings, replace the roof segments, add signage, add lighting, add solar panels, add retaining walls, add fencing, and make related improvements um, without the without um, condition one applied. Is that? Yes, or okay. striking condition one. Yeah. Condition one. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Commissioner Vanderike seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Vanderike. Is there any further discussion? Um, seeing none, um, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion? Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Vanderijk. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. Thank you. That motion passes. The applicant may speak to staff tomorrow about next steps. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to have a good discussion about an important topic. Um, that concludes our public hearing items. Um, do commissioners or staff have any announcements or commission business to discuss? Perhaps some reminders about our upcoming retreat or something? Andrea? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think everybody's well aware, but yes, we have our retreat this Thursday starting at three. Um, we have a full agenda of topics, so thank you to everyone who submitted topics. I appreciate it. Um, I had more than I could include on the agenda. Um, that will happen. Um, I have sent that out, so everybody who's kind of requested, I've essentially kind of have asked that you kind of help me tee off the discussion for those particular items. Um, and one other point to mention as things in, I, I don't have full info on this yet, but as things in the world are changing and moving, um, the city is reevaluating right now kind of the work from home um, orders at this point. Um, there has been a date set of September 7th to go back into the office. Um, there's also not a firm direction, but there is talk um, about when the emergency regulation will expire, which then ends our requirement to meet or allows us to meet virtually such as we are right now. Um, that is still up in the air. There have been no um, firm declarations, but just to give every commissioner a heads up that those are being discussed and there um, appears to be a, a time in the foreseeable short future that we may not be meeting virtually again and probably in person, um, but I don't know when that is. Um, so I just wanted to make a, an announcement, sort of a vague announcement that that is, that is on the horizon. Um, and I do believe that is all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Um, for our new commissioners for the retreat, normally we'd like have tasty food and stuff available while we're discussing things. So I don't know, bring your own tasty treats to our virtual meeting. Um, any other announcements or commission business? Doesn't seem like it. And since we'll, you know, I'll be seeing each other in just a couple days, um, maybe it'll all just come up then. So with that, we have completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will again ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. There being no other business this meeting, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is well, I guess it's our retreat on May 20th. I don't know if that counts as a regular meeting. Um, thank you, everyone.